foam for making histological incisions, staining jars, hot plates, water baths, a minus 20 degree Celsius freezer, 1D protein electrophoresis, and DNA electrophoresis. This laboratory is also used for cytotoxicity and genotoxicity analysis of special stains. The research activities carried out in the laboratory of structure and development of animals are Animal House Animal House is a facility used for breeding and research of experimental animals as well as providing experimental animals for research purpose. In addition to the research laboratory, the biology laboratory has additional facilities, namely a greenhouse, a wire house, and an experimental pond. Greenhouse is enclosed by a translucent laser light roof, paranet roof, and a wire wall covered with steel mosquito net to prevent insects and small animals from entering the greenhouse. With adequate laboratory facilities, of course, it can support all existing learning and research activities as well as develop potential, bring innovation to achieve more. Good morning, Dr. Mafis. Is my voice clear, doctor? Hi, Dr. Mayafis. How are Hello. you? Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Welcome to Jakarta, yeah, doctor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I would like to information. This is the our first step, yeah, Dr. Mayafis. Ah. <laughs> uh, Budekan, Alhamdulillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Oke, okay, good, af good afternoon. Uh, Miss Mavis, I give... How, how we spell your name? M-A-V-I-S. Mavis. Mm. <laughs> Mavis. Aq 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 what? Yeah. Okay. Aq Aq Champo. Oh, okay. Aq Aq Champo. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bulia, you will start. Ya, yeah, Bu Fina, mangga silakan. Baik. Ya, yeah. silakan Aulia. Okay, thank you uh, for Miss Delia and uh, Miss Fina and also for the Dean and uh, welcome Miss Mavis, Miss Mavis Agiwa Champong. Uh, let me open for uh, today's session. 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening and also good morning for Dr. Mavis Agiwa Kampong. And greeting to all of us, Honorable Coordinator of the Biology Student Program, Ms. Dr. Dalia Sukmawati, MSc, and Honorable Chairperson of the Even, Ms. Tina Triskawati, PhD, and Honorable for Mr. and Ms. Biology Faculty Member who have taken the time to attend and my esteemed fellow participants. Also, sincere appreciation to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Mapis Agiwa Akampo, for graciously joining us for today's event. We appraise our gratitude to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who has granted us health and His blessings, so that we can attend the Biology Insight Entomopathology event on biological control of K insect pests of crops in Ghana, lessons, challenges, and opportunities. May blessing and peace be upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his family, and his compassion for eternity. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. I am Aulerib Desabitah, biology student from Unitas Negeri Jakarta 2021, and I'm honored to serve as your master of ceremony for today's Biology Insight, and will guide you for the opening and closing in this event. The agenda today is as is follow, First is recitation of prayers, continued by opening speech from the coordinator of biology program at Agnipa UNJ, Dr. Dalia Sukmawati, MSE, and followed by the dean of Agnipa UNJ, Professor Dr. Muktiningsi, a magister of science, and opening session by the moderator, reading CV, uh, reading CV from the speaker, presentation of material by Dr. Mathis Agiwa Tempo, and discussion session and also a symbolic certificate presentation and closing. Before starting the event, let me guide to for us to do pray first. Please proceed with your time and please and peace and for smooth proceeding protection and knowledge acquisition for all the participants. Kindly join me in a moment of prayer. Time and place, pray begin. Okay, the prayer is up. Thank you, everyone. May those who raise prayers reward goodness. Amin, ya Rabbah, amin. At the next event is singing the international Indonesian national anthem to all participants and invited guests and all faculty members are requested to sit outside and listen with the wisdom. To the operator, please help me to play the national anthem. Thank you. and everyone who has listened to the Indonesian National Anthem. Before we continue the session, uh, let me read 
for the rules for this for today's session. First, participants are expected to change the name to format year of enrollment underscore for name. And second, participants are expected to turn on the camera feature and mute the microphone before being allowed by the moderator. Third, participants are expected to use virtual background provided by the committee. And fourth, attendance will be noted for, from the participants' camera feature screenshot and by registration form. I will remind all of the participants if you only fill the registration form without joining the event until the end of the session, it will not count it as a 10. And if you just join the Zoom without filling the registration form for it also can't be counted. Thank you. And next, we have our coordinator, Ms. Delia Sukmawati, to give the opening speech from for today's session. And I will invite Ms. Delia Sukmawati to join with us. And the time is yours. Thank you very much, moderator. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greeting with my honor to our Dean, Professor Mukti Dingsi, our Dean in Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, Universitas Negeri Jakarta, our faculty members and our students and all of my uh, particip all of the participants. Thank you very much for your willingness to attend this meeting. And with my great honor to Dr. Mavis as uh, our speaker to, uh, in this afternoon. The biology inside even is one, it will be one year program. It will be featured speaker from around the world and from various fields relative to biology. The event will be held and monthly and I hope this all member of the academic uh, community, especially biology student, will benefit for it. As a coordinator of the biology program at University Negeri Jakarta, we are very welcome to the seminar at biology control of the key, the crop in the Ghana. I hope this is our collaboration and this is the, our commitment to be challenging in good sec uh, agricultural sector and particularly in the content and pest control in the Ghana. And as a coordinator of the biology program, I am responsible to the curriculum development in the research and in the education in field of biology. And I believe this seminar will contribute to strengths and understanding agriculture ecosystem and dynamic of the important biology based on approach of the pest control. Without further, I really thanks to Dr. Mavis and I hope this is our new step to make a new collaboration for the next with a good step. And I hope this is the first uh, our meet and after this, we can make more and more joint collaboration. For all the member, Thank you very much to attend this. And of course, for our Dean, thank you for all of the support for our program. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Ms. Delia, for your opening speech. And the next event will continue and followed by opening speech from the Dean of the FNIPA UNJ, Professor Dr. Murtinisi. And I will invite Dr. Mukhining C to join with us to give the opening speech and the time is yours. Okay, thank you, Aulia. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and good afternoon, uh, Ms. Mavis. Uh, this is a very uh, nice opportunity to have this seminar together yeah uh, i appreciate to dr dalia the new uh, head of study program of biology and then she always have uh, a new idea to make the collaboration yeah and then i would like to uh, thank also to uh, miss mapis 
Agiwa, uh, welcome to our university, our faculty. This is, uh, I wish this is uh, the first, the first, and then uh, we will continue to another meeting, another activity, so uh, we can uh, make a strength collaboration together. Yeah. Uh, we will uh, learn together how to uh, manage. Yeah, we also, this uh, Indonesia is like an agriculture uh, country. So we can learn together how to manage the crop. Uh, I, I just read your CV and then I uh, saw many experience about the crop. So uh, a member here in our faculty, especially for uh, biology department, yeah, uh, we can learn together. So uh, I wish it's not only by online, we invite also you come to our country. So uh, maybe next time you can uh, visit us here in Indonesia. So we can, uh, we can have a time together in Indonesia. Uh, in this seminar, I think not only for the faculty member, but also for the student from the Department of Biology. So please, uh, you can uh, take more, uh, more value for this collaboration. We can uh, discuss each other, we can share our knowledge each other. So uh, not only for the lecturer, but uh, student can also learn together with us. Thank you uh, for Ms. Mafis and thank you for Ms. Dahlia. Uh, I wish this seminar is uh, going nicely. And uh, with uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I open this seminar uh, between collaboration be between uh, our faculty, FMIPA UNJ, and Ghana University. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Ms. Mutinisi, for your remarks and open and officially open this session. With the introductory segment is concluded, I am pleased to introduce Ms. Fina Riskawati MSc, who will moderate today's event. But before continuing the event, I will remind again all the participants are requested to activate your cameras as it is obligated for all the participants to be counted as a 10. And I will give the session to Mr. Ms. Fina Riskawati, um, Magister of Science. The time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Aulia, for your um, opening. Okay, good morning, Dr. Mafis. And now in Indonesia already afternoon. So uh, we have very limited time in here, but hopefully uh, we can still enjoy uh, today's seminar. And welcome to Universitas Negeri Jakarta. My name is Fida Rizkawati, and I'm the one of the lecturer in uh, biology department, especially in ONG. And I will be serving you as uh, today's moderator. And in this session, uh, you will be hearing uh, from Dr. Mavis uh, presentation, but before we get, get started, I think I want to take a few minutes of uh, your time to know deeper about our speaker. So let me share the curriculum vitae of our speakers. So this is uh, the curriculum curriculum vitae of Dr. Mavis Agiwa Achampong. Yeah, so uh, she is a uh, master in entomology, yeah, specifically. She got uh, her uh, Bachelor of Science in Agriculture in University of Ghana, and also a uh, master of uh, philosophy yeah, in crop science, University of Ghana, and she continued PhD course in uh, Rhodes University. Okay, and for academic award, we can see that uh, she got a lot of awards yeah, since 2012 until 2022. And her current employment 
uh, now uh, she is lecturer in Department of Crop Science, University of Ghana since 2020 until now. And uh, there are a lot of research experience in here. Her doctoral course, yeah, about uh, entomopathogenic fungal isolates, yeah, for microbial control of uh, citrus space, yeah, in here. And research assistant, yeah, some of the research, master research, undergraduate research, and also some uh, publication in here, publication experience in here, and many more. So uh, I cannot uh read all of them because there are too many so i think it's better to start to the presentation yeah. so today's uh presentation uh we will move to the main session yeah so please welcome dr mafis who will be talking about biological control of key insect pests of crops in ghana uh, listen, challenges, and opportunities. So, Dr. Mafis, time is yours. Thank you very much for having me. It's morning here, but it's evening in Indonesia. So, good afternoon to you all. We, um, all faculty, all students, all participants joining me. I have some Ghanaian colleagues joining me, so I'm grateful to them. So, to them, I say good morning. Some of my mentors are also joining, so thank you all for having me. Yes, so as we are all aware, I'm going to present on biological control of key insect pests of crops in Ghana, lessons, challenges, and opportunities. And my name is, again, is Mavis Ejewa Echampo from University of Ghana. So before the presentation, I'm sure we are all here for biological control, but I will take you through my country, so that when you come to West Africa, you know you have to come to Ghana first. So I'll take you through my country and where I'm coming from, the School of Agriculture, the department, and then go straight to why we are here, which is on some of the biological control programs that we put in place for our key in set pace of course in Ghana. So this is where I am. I'm in Ghana, West Africa, very beautiful country. 33 million people, English is our official language, and our beautiful capital city is Accra. So hopefully you should come and visit us soon. You will see a lot of um, tourist sites, our famous Larabanga Mosque, which is the oldest in, one of the oldest in West Africa and the oldest in Ghana, very beautiful. Elmina Castle, we have several, this town is on uh, water, it's called Inzulezu Village, the village on water. It's in western region of Ghana. Then we also have some nice parks, Smolin National Park, Kakum Park, and some monkey sanctuary. Then our famous club, which is Kenti, we call it Kenti, made of um, hand woven silk and cotton, very beautiful, as you can see from the photograph here. It's one of our prestigious clubs, so we wear it usually on uh, festive occasions and important occasions. Then our major economic activities, of course, Ghana is Coco, or Coco is Ghana. Once you hear Ghana, you know you are coming to the Coco city or country. <laughs> we are the second largest producer. We come after Ivory Coast, so Ghana is Coco. Then, of course, so once you are consuming your chocolate, you should remember you are eating from Ghana, so you have to visit us as well. <laughs> then we also have gold. We are also the Africa's leading producer of gold. And then, of course, our crops. Agriculture is a major economic activity in my country. We have our maize, as you can see, the happy faces, happy farmers here producing their maize. And, of course, chili pepper. Chili pepper is, chili pepper is also grown 
here a lot because almost all our meals, I mean, it's an indispensable ingredient. Every meal in Ghana contains pepper. So if you, you can't take this hot spice, then you are in trouble. Come with your own food when coming to Ghana. So that's, that's for you, chili pepper. Then, of course, our culture, we have some nice festivals, masquerade festivals, usually in December, at the end of the year. So you can come for your holidays here. Have a Adowa. You can see some international uh, uh, students enjoying our Adowa dance here from Ashanti region of Ghana. And our food, fufu, very delicious. We also, you can see we have roasted plantain here. Very nice as well. And then we have our famous red red too, which is made from ripe plantain that has been fried and then beans. Then of course we have our games too. We have our football and then uh, um, and then the rest. So rest assured you will not be bored when you come to my country. Yes, so I'm coming from University of Ghana, the best in my country. It was founded in uh, 1948, so we, we were actually 75 years old last, I guess, um, last year. So quite, not too old, but relatively old, 75 years. As I said earlier, it's the best in my country. We are first in Ghana and second in West Africa. And we have quite a number of students here too. Our university is uh, manned by our, our vice chancellor. We have a central administration system. So our vice chancellor is Professor Nanaba Ampiampo. The chancellor is Mrs. Mary Chensing Kess. We have four colleges College of Basic and Applied Sciences, where I'm coming from. We have education, health, and then, of course, our school of graduate studies, making it five. Four colleges. Day. Then we also have international programs. So some students, we have some collaborative um, university that we collaborate with or partner university that we collaborate with. And then they come, some of their students come. You can always come, you're always welcome to come. You come, we share in our culture, we share in our courses. So you come and take some of the courses for a semester or two, bond with us, learn our culture, eat our food, and then go back to your country to continue your studies. Then, where I am, School of Agriculture. So School of Agriculture is under College of Basic and Applied Sciences. School of Agriculture. So under School of Agriculture, we also have our dean, who is also a woman, happily. So we have our vice chancellor, and chancellor, and then our dean, the dean of my school being a woman, which I'm very proud and happy about. <laughs> okay, so in our in school of agriculture, we also have the department of several departments of about five departments in the school. We have crop science, soil science, animal science, agriculture economics, agriculture extension, and consumer sciences. So I'm coming from crop science. We have other departments as well under our school. So I'm from Department of Crop Science. This is Department of Crop Science, and you can see my, my name written small here. So that, that, this is my office, the door. So we run several um, undergraduate programs. We have our courses in agronomy, horticulture, breeding, plant pathology and homology, and crop protection. We have the master's, we have PhD, we have undergraduate. So you can graduate with um, BSc Agriculture, Crop Science, or any of these um, specializations, breeding, pathology, entomology, and crop protection. The same for masters and the same for PhD. So we run all programs, these programs in my department. As I said earlier, chili pepper is, is very important in my country, and we are proud to be one. Um, the first to uh, develop this particular chili pepper variety. We call it Legon 18. It's coming from our school, University of Ghana, so Legon 18. So Legon 18 chili pepper variety 
was developed by my department, Department of Health Science. Then we also have others, several others. We have some Okra, we have Kalkin, which were all developed by my department. Of course, we have several first class and uh, world class facilities. One which is also a sister department or unit within my department is what is referred to as the West African Center for Crop Improvement. World class facilities or um, equipment and uh, facilities are very well equipped. And they are have very useful and very important instruments and equipment there. We have other world class facilities as well, but of course I'm biased because I'm coming from a project as well. Showing you this one here. We run PhD and master's programs so in plant breeding. So if you want to come and do PhD in plant breeding or MSc or MPhil plant breeding, this is the place for you. West Africa Center for Crop Improvement. Now, now that you know where I'm coming from, my country, let's go to my favorite part, which is our entomopathology. Of course, just as we have in other countries, in my country, we have several insect pests. Some of the important ones are horse codling moth, fruit flies, which is almost everywhere, millibars, and then now four amino or maize, very invasive. Several others as well, but for now, these are the most important ones. Horse codling moth is very cosmopolitan, it has several host crops. Once it gets into your country, you are in trouble because it's in fact several crops, more than 500 crops. Importantly, it's preferred um, host is pepe and um, citrus, but pepe garden eggs and several other vegetables are also host to this particular insect. As you can see here, this is the lab, the final insect lab of the post cotton moth. It develops, it's the adult moth goes and lays on the fruits. And then the new meat, which is the first larvae enters where they will feed through, through the final insta stages and then destroy the fruit. It will cause fruit dropping, it will cause rotting. At the end of the day, every the fruit is going to drop. It, it comes out after the final insta stage, which is what you see here, the fifth insta larvae. Once it has developed from the first to the fifth, it comes out beneath the soil to about 10, 10 centimeters to come and pupate under the soil, in the soil. Once they pupate, then they, they repeat the cycle. The adult goes, lays in the um, fruit, and then repeats it, destroys our fruit. And the most important thing about this particular insect pest is, is that because of its wide, wide uh, the way it destroys a lot of crops, Nobody wants it in their country. Very invasive, so it is regarded as a phytosanitary insect pest in the EU, European Union, and other places where it's not there. Even if they detect a single lamin in your fruit, you are in trouble. The entire consignment of exportable fruits will be rejected. So nobody wants cost for them, especially in European Union, they don't want it in their country. So it's regarded as a phytosanitary insect pest, and because of that, we are very, very serious with control. And you know, because chemical control, which also gives us some small level of control, or some, some, so to speak, satisfactory level of control, that has been the key control measure for this pest. But you know, as you, we are all aware, chemical control is also stringently regulated by these export markets. You don't have to exceed some uh, limits, the residual limits, and some, some of the useful chemicals that are infective against as several of these insects are also not even allowed at all. So Emma, the chemicals that are providing effective control are also stringently regulated. It means we have to look for non-chemical control options, which will be more useful as far as export is concerned. So this is very, very important. First of all, very important in my country, as far as export of pepper is concerned. Very important. For armyworm is also very important. It was not here, but now it's a, it came to our country in 2016. And now it has been very, very devastating on our maize. For armyworm, everybody is talking about for armyworm. 
if, if it, it behaves similarly like the first quadrilateral move, very, very destructive entities. Then we also have our fruit flies on our fruits. Also, phytosanitary tree insect pests as well. So all these things require pragmatic control options. Now, chemicals, our export, uh, exporting markets don't want to. So it means we have to look for non-chemical control options. Non-chemical control options have become very, very important. And it's not just in, in, in my country. Everywhere, everybody is looking for chemi non-chemical control. Because the chemicals are not good for our, on our, on our environment. They are not good on our health as well. We don't want it. So what do we do? We have to look for bio-rational control options. Now, this is where entomopathology comes in. Entomopathology comes in. Entomopathology, as you can deduce from the name, means insect pathology, entomopathology. Yes, so what are these entomopathogens that I'm talking about? Entomopathogenic, entomopathogens can be fungi, they can be bacteria, they can be viruses, but I prefer the fungi one, entomopathogenic fungi one. The reason why most entomopathologists prefer the fungi one is that unlike their counterpart bacteria or viruses whose control is narrow because the insects, the uh, pathogen must be ingested before they can actually the pathogen can cause infection within the insects. The fungi one day they are percutic, percutaneously infected. That is, that is to say, they infect by contact. Once they come in contact with the insects and environmental conditions are favorable, they can germinate, go inside the uh, insects and go and kill the insects, cause infection to later kill the insects. So and that is why I, we prefer the entomopathogenic fungi. Entomopathogenic fungi, as I said earlier, are very useful. They are percutaneously infected. They infect by contact. And they are ubiquitous in soils. You can get them easily in the soil because that's their natural place. They occur naturally in soils. All you do is to isolate them from the soils and develop them into biological control agents. The benefits are enormous. They are relatively safer. Of course, they are better than the chemicals. Several experiments <coughs> has been conducted, have been conducted, uh, toxicity of mammalian tissues have been done, and we've seen that there's minimal risk to non-beneficial organisms as well. They are not going to be uh, problematic on our water, they are not going to be problematic on our other biological control atropos, like the predators and parasitoids. So that is why entomopathogens are important. They are highly compatible with several integrated pest management programs. You can use it and use your, of course, with ju judicious use of chemicals, you can use it and use your predators and parasitoids of insects that are also used to supplement control, of course, biological control. So entomopathogenic fungi are very, very important. You can get them naturally in soils and they've been used globally against atropod insect pests. What you see here, green muscle, which was developed against a Okay, I, I, I will increase my voice. I've been told. To. <laughs> Thank you. So let me go over. Since my voice was low, let me try to start with the entomopathogens, pathogenic fungi. Entomopathogens, as I said, can be fungi, can be nematodes, can be viruses, can be bacteria. But we prefer the entomopathogenic fungi. 
because fungi, you know, even in plant pathology, fungi have an added advantage over the rest. And that is even the reason why they are the predominant causes of plant disease, because they can actually infect by contact. Once a, once a virus or probably a bacteria will need a wound or natural openings for them to enter through the plant, fungi can actually undergo direct penetration. And that is the reason why they are the predominant causes of plant diseases. So that is why in entomo pathology, we also prefer entomo pathogenic fungi because the viruses and the bacteria, you, their control window is very narrow. The, the pathogens needs to be ingested before control can be effective. But with entomo pathogenic fungi, once they come in contact with the insects, the fungi one, I'm referring to the fungi one. Once they come in contact with the insects, environmental conditions are favorable. They can germinate and go inside the insects and cause infection. How does the infection take place? Once they germinate and enter the insects, they use the insects as a food source. So they are going to the, use the hemolymph of the insect or the insect body as food source. They are also going to be multiplying in the insects. So there's going to be a lot of biomass of the fungus or fungi inside the insects. Then they are also going to produce toxins against the insects. So within three to seven days, the insects will set, 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 uh, certainly succumb to infection and die. They go inside, use the insect, uh, insects as food source, produce toxins against the insects, and by their biomass, their presence, their mycelium and conidia or reproductive units inside the insects, they will cause infection. But unlike the chemicals that are going to control the insect within, uh, hopefully in some cases, minutes or hours, this entopathogenic fungi can only cause infection from the third to seventh day before the insect will die. So sometimes people don't like somehow say biological control agents are not so active because it's not as fast as would as our chemicals would have been. So that is that. Nonetheless, of course, we can't continue to use chemicals. We have to go for greener or biorational control options. So we have to supplement our chemical control. If possible, take it out and bring in these bio, bio rational control options because they are more safer and they are more safer for us, our health and our environment. We can't continue with the chemicals. So that is why I love entomopathology. We have to use them as alternative non-chemical control options, options for, for our agricultural insects and even our medical insect pests. That is that. So entomopathogenic fungi, as I said, are relatively safer. Several mammalian toxicity tests have been conducted and found uh, non-rest. I, it's, it's also highly, highly compatible with several IPM programs. The good thing about this entro pathogenic fungi is that normally, for instance, if you have your targeted insect pests and you have your predators or parasitoids as well in your field to, to uh, augment or supplement your control strategy, fortunately for us, these entro pathogenic fungi are less infective to the uh, non-target or beneficial atropot insect pests like the predators and the parasitoids. The good thing is that they are also less toxic to like our bees, our, our pollinators and the rest. They are less toxic. So for instance, if it's going to cause about 80% mortality of our targeted insect pests, as far as the predators and parasitoids are concerned, it will kill, let's say, 10% or even less. So they are very, very useful minimal risk to beneficial non-targeted organism, and it's also very safe for our environment. Now, we also know that they have endophytic benefits. They can actually uh, exist as endophytes in plant tissues and still exert their insecticidal acti activities, which is very, very, very useful, especially because of the downside to the use of endophytes. I mean, entropathogenic fungi, which I will get to very soon, the downside to their use. Yes, so now we know that most of these entropathogenic fungi 
are endophytic. And by their presence, just by the fact that they are endophytic, the connection of Dr. Mavis is not good. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think we will wait for Dr. Mavis for some time to rejoin again. Okay. okay. I would like to thank you to Dr. Leith. Welcome, Dr. Leith. Thank you very much for introduce your collaborator to uh, our biology department. Welcome, Dictator. Welcome, Dictator. Thank you very much, Dictator Daria. Hello, Dr. Leit. Hi. Thank you very much, Martin. Dr. Leit. Okay, Dr. Mafis. My apologies. I have to switch to another computer. Okay, no the problem. The first one. Can you please hear me? Am I on? Yeah, uh, we can hear your voice. Okay, uh, I think I'm still... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Mafis. Okay. Okay. Okay, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so back to the benefits. I've talked about the benefits. They are safer. They are IPM compatible. They have endophytic benefits. So you can spray them and then they'll exit as endophytes on the plant tissues and exert their insecticidal activities. Now, we also know that by being endophytic on the plant, they are able to uh, give some sort of resistance to the plant or protect the plant against plant pathogens as well. Initially or traditionally, we thought they were just insect pathogens, but now we know we have added advantages. By being endophytic on the plant, they are able to um, um, fight against plant disease or ensure some resistance on, on the plant to um, lower incidences and severities of uh, plant diseases on our economically important plants. So we know that they are very, very beneficial, not just for our insect pests, but also for our plants against plant pathogens. Now, let's go to the downside to the use of this entomopathogenic fungi. As I said earlier, there are slow speed of kill. Once a chemical is going to give you some kill within minutes or hours, our entomopathogens are going to only kill after th the third or seventh day. But of course, we can't always, we can't say that because they are going to kill within three days. We won't use it. We have to use these entomopathogens to supplement other biological control agents. And as I always say, biological control works if you make sure you do the other control options. It works perfectly in integrated pest management. You can't say I'm using entomopathogenic fungi and stop, I mean, neglect other components of your IPM, which is like your sanitation and, for instance, your predators and parasitoids uh, control uh, strategies as well. And additionally, or, or importantly, one of their key constraints or downside is their extreme sensitivity to abiotic environmental factors. Yes, just like other microbial control agents like our trichoderma and the rest, they are all, because they are microorganisms, they are highly, highly sensitive to abiotic environmental constraints, environmental factors, especially UV radiation. After two hours, some of them are very, very, very sensitive. After two hours, is going to kill your microbes. So how do you get your control? Nonetheless, proper formulation with UV um, protectants can help you get your control because of course you have UV protectant. So it's going to minimize the impact of UV radiation on your proper girls to be able to help you achieve your control. control. So formulation is key as far as getting these central pathogens to work is concerned. They are very, very, very sensitive to um, UV radiation. Now, although this is a constraint, this is actually not too much of a problem because it depends on the isolate. 
Some isolates are less susceptible compared to others. Some isolates are very, 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 very susceptible. So uh, um, this takes me to my one of my, uh, I think, my PhD work. So I am, um, you know, citrus is very big in South Africa. The citrus industry is highly, highly big. They are the second largest exporter and producer. So they export a lot of the world citrus. And as I said earlier, chemical control is also a problem because of maximum residue level. So their biological control strategy, strategies are very, they work a lot on getting, trying to get a lot of several uh, biological control agents to supplement chemical control so that they're able to meet the chemical residue limits restrictions by their key um, markets, key export markets. So one of their control, and I'm proud to say that they are the first to produce the first baculovirus. Baculovirus, as I said earlier, that the entomopathogens can be viruses as well. So baculovirus is the first one. The first one that was produced in South in Africa was produced by South Africa. Cryptogram, very, very effective. It's also an entomopathogen. So it's working, but they wanted more. So they, they, they tried to, about 10 years research, they tried to, get entomopathogenic fungi to supplement their yeah, baculovirus and predators and parasitoids that are used in controlling insect pests of citrus. So they were able to get highly effective entomopathogenic fungi from soils in South Africa. This entomopathogenic fungi work very well against, as you can see from this um, diagram or photo, you see that they are spraying it against a uh, subterranean or soil dwelling stages of false codling moth. They were trying to use it against false codling moth, which is the key insect pest of citrus. So this entomopathogenic fungi work very well against the soil dwelling stages. Why? Because there, UV, if there at all, will be very minimal. Temperature too is also a key con uh, abiotic constraint, but it's also less fluctuating, and it will be less. It will be hot, um, less problematic as far as the soil dwelling stages or environment is concerned. So it worked very well against false codling moth. They had about 80% reduction in field trials. And this was even with aqueous suspensions. It was not even a proper formulation with oil. It was just water. Aqueous suspensions of the entomopathogenic fungi. It worked very well against the soil dwelling stages of the false codling moth, which is the PUP. But now, when they tried it against millibats and tricks, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because of UV and temperature. There, you would have UV working against your propagules, which is the fungi. You have temperature, high temperatures, which will also be inimical to their germination and growth of the fungi. So it didn't work against millibats. So in the selection process, you have to be very careful. Because in this research, we realized that the isolates that were taken to the field, which yielded very su huge success against the false codling moth, were highly, highly sensitive to UV radiation. And th this has been published. 2021 of my papers in um, fungal biology. We realized that the uh, um, isolates that were taken to the field, that worked very well against the soil dwelling insects were highly, highly, highly sensitive to UV radiation. After one hour, two hours, everything was gone. They were all dead. So that was why it didn't work against the trips and the millibats, which are folia or uh, tree-dwelling insects or arborea insect pest. So that is that. So it means that although they are very helpful, we need them in insects or integrated pest management program. When you are selecting the strain, you have to be very careful. You have to make sure you select, you select strains that are highly or less susceptible to UV radiation and then have, of course, their temperature tolerance is also moderate. Then of course you have to select, you have to keep in mind that your target is the mortality or the violence. So it has to be violent, but not just violent. You have to make sure all the biological traits of the fungus is known so that if you, for instance, you realize that, oh, this, this pathogen is very 
violent, but is highly sensitive to UV radiation, what, what do I do? Then you formulate to take care of the UV aspects of the isolates to make sure that it's very robust for control. So that is that. So that takes us to the EPF strain selection process. How do you select them? Remember, we said they are good, they need to be selected. But how do you select them? You have to isolate them first. We'll go through the isolation quickly, but you have to isolate them. These are the stages that you go through to select effective strains for development into a product. So you isolate them from soils. Then you test its virulence against your targeted insect test. So if you want it against maize pests, then you test it against your maize pests. If you want it against cocoa pests, then you test it against that. Then you also determine the other biological traits of the fungi. As I said, they are highly sensitive to these key environmental constraints, temperature, humidity, UV radiation. You have to test them as well and select the best for the field especially if your targeted uh, organism is on the arboreal environment or the tree environment. If it's in the soil environment, then you are okay. If it's, it's a bit okay because temperatures and UV there will not be left, will not be very, very inimical to your fungi. Then certainly you have to do mass production. In fact, some of the entomopathogens are very good, especially those ones that are in the entomophthorelian, the other entomophthorelians. They are very, very good, but they are not amenable to mass production. You can't culture them in vitro. And if you can't culture them in vitro, how will you do the product or how will you, will you formulate your product? Because you can't get a lot of spores. So the isolate you are going to select must also be amenable to mass production. You should be able to get a lot of spores from it. You should produce the, the best. So in your strain selection, this is what you go or you do to select the best. And then you do your formulation for your targeted uh, environment. We have several formulations, just like the chemicals you can have your, if you are going to use it against stored product pests, like maybe maize, stored uh, post-harvest uh, crops, or like maize after harvesting, then it means you have to do a, a powder formulation and not a liquid formulation because in the stored product environment, you don't want moisture day. So you have to do a powder formulation. If you are targeting the normal field or pre-harvest environment, then it means you have to do a liquid formulation supplement by adjuvants and then oils and then the rest. That's one. Several formulations can be done. So that is that with the isolation. That is that with the strain selection criteria. So this is the isolation. And as I said earlier, entomopathogenic fungi are readily available or ubiquitous in the soil. They are very, very easy to get in the soil. You use this insect, Galeria melonella. You can equally use other baiting insect species, like the mealworm and even your targeted insect species that you want, you can use it for baiting. You just go for the soils from your um, field and then use this Galeria uh, insects to bait them from the soil. Very easy to do. Um, literature is there on their uh, baiting process. Very easy. You just keep them in the soil and then check them daily and check the mortality. Those ones that, that die, then you surface sterilize them with sterilants like alcohol and bleach to get these entomopathogenic fungi from there. So normally these ones are what is referred to as barbaria and the green ones are the metarizum. It's been developed globally. We have several uh, products on the market against insect pests, and it's used very well. You can equally use media. If you don't have this Galeria in your country, you can use media to isolate them. Of course, because there are several fungi in the soil, you have to make sure that um, the media is selected. Normally, we use a fungicide called Dodin to make it selective so that you can exclude unwanted fungi and get just your entomopathogenic fungi for development. Then you do, once you have your fungi, then you do your laboratory assays against your targeted insect pests. Normal standardized assays can be done. Depends on your targeted insect pests. Then of course, as we said earlier, you have to check all other biological traits of the fungus so that you select the best and not just an, a fungus that is violent. You select, you, you take into consideration the temperature tolerance, the humidity assays or humidity tolerance 
you can do the humidity test. You can regulate the humidity with salt, saturated salt solutions, as we all know in science, give specified humidity. So you can test all the humidity, uh, any humidity that is prevalent in your targeted area of control. So that you select those ones that will, will suit the humidity in your control environment. Then, of course, you also check, this is very important, UV is very key. So you check the UV sensitivity trials. You can check, this device is actually called the Kelsan. Very, very useful device. It's able to simulate um, normal or solar radiations or the UV spectra, UVB, UV. Of course, UVB is the most important because it's the most damaging to your fungal properties. But, I mean, you have... You can exclude your UVC, which is not needed. And then you have your UVA and UVB, very important equipment. If you don't have it, you can equally use UV lamps to determine the UV sensitivity of the isolates. Then, of course, the endophytic potentials can also be done. You only inoculate your propagals on your targeted uh, plants and see whether they'll be able to exist as endophytes inside the plants and then you can equally do other um, assays to check after endophytic potential or endophytic establishment, what happens next? Can they exert some insecticidal active activities even after they are endophytic? Or can they exert some um, put, um, promise or can, can they be beneficial against plant pathogens? As well? So all those ones can be done after endophytic potential establishment. This is also, also well um well documented in literature, how to determine the endophytic uh, potential is also well documented, something that can be done very easily. So that is that. Let's go for these biological control agents. They are safer, they, are, uh, they, they can be used, and they can be used and they can give us very good control, just like the chemicals. If you, are, uh, if you make sure your other integrated pest management programs are also in place, then why not? They can equally give you your control like the chemicals. Sanitation is key. Predators and paratosoids are, are key. So yes, so that is that with the entomopathogen, just an overview of what they are, they are. Now on some of the biological control program for our key insect pests of crops in Ghana. As I said earlier, when I showed you, I said Ghana is cocoa. So let's come to our cocoa. What is happening? Our main insect pests are capsis, mirids, miridi. Capsis, cocoa capsis, emilibus. Very, very destructive. They can actually cause, you can actually even lose almost everything. 60%, 60 to 100% if you don't, if you don't affect any control strategy or method against this insect pest. Very, very, very destructive. Attacking almost all parts of the plant. Millibats, cocoa capsis, emilibus. Non-chemical control, of course, is also important because, as I keep saying, our maximum residue limits are regulated. So if we don't get non-chemical control options, then we are in trouble because we can't keep using the chemical. So we are I'm actually trying to develop a micro-insecticide against the capsis. We've started, we are, we've gotten very, very useful results and hopefully we'll be able to develop a product for the cocoa industry in Ghana. So I'm looking at using some of these entomopathogenic fungi as a, a commercial micro-insecticide against the cocoa capsules. We've had very good preliminary results, so we are yet to develop it into a product. So that is that with our cocoa industry. Now, chili pepper. False codling moth is the most important insect pest for chili pepper. Very, very, very destructive. Every crop, all the fruits are going to drop or rot against because of this insect pest. Very, very, very destructive. And especially because we also export or get a lot, our farmers get a lot of or, or, or get a lot of income from this, this um, crop, which is the chili pepper, especially the exports. Tackling is, is very important in Ghana. In fact, because of this pest, we were banned. I think in 2015, we were banned. Ghana was banned from exporting chili pepper because of this pest. Because once they intercept one, two, you are in trouble, they'll ban you. 
So you make sure your prey harvest control strategies are very strong, especially the non-chemical ones are very strong, such that you will not be able to get, they will not be able to intercept one at the uh, importing market. So we were banned in 2015, but because we put in a lot of these biological control aid, uh, agents in place, and we've made sure we do proper pre adverse screening, cleaning, and even pre adverse control strategies, judicious use of chemicals supplemented with other non-chemical control options. Now we are still, we are exporting our pepe. The ban has been lifted, but it caused us a lot. We lost a lot of money because of this false cod morph interception in EU. So it's very important. So I'm currently trying to develop a micro insecticide against this in insect pest as well, for Scotland more. So I was very fortunate and blessed to be awarded an OWSD funding of US dollar 50,000 to obtain a microbial plant extra product for chili pepper farmers in Ghana. OWSD is Organization for Women in Science in Developing World. So you can check them out, especially for women scientists. They, they are very, very, very helpful. In 2022, I had this grant to develop a microbial plant extract product for the uh, chili pepper farmers in Ghana. In essence, this product is actually looking at not just the false cod limo, or the, not just, sorry, the entopathogenic fungi. As you can see here, I said microbial plant extracts, MPE products. So I'm going to combine not just the entomopathogenic fungi, but entomopathogenic fungi plus beneficial uh, uh, bacterium like Pseudomonas and plant extracts like neem and others but, uh, into a product, one product, so that because phosphor limoff is not the only constraint for the chili pepper farmers in Ghana. We're also looking at mosaic, mosaic diseases and other other um, phytophthora blight, for instance, is also very important. So I'm looking at combining the entopathogens with, like, let's say, neem, so that at least we'll be able to get a very good control and not just control against a product that will be effective against the false column of the mosaic disease, the, hopefully the phytophthora blight, as well, which are all key constraints to chili pepper production in my country. So hopefully, you know, as scientists, we know sometimes when you try to combine a... Uh, especially after two, they, it becomes problematic. You can combine Bulgaria with trichoderma or Bulgaria with neem to get a lot of control. But once you add that something else, it becomes, the synergism becomes a little bit constrained. So that is what I'm looking at currently, to get a, a microbial plant extract uh, products for farmers against false cod limoff and other plant diseases of chili pepper in my country. So that is that for chili pepper. Now, for maize, as I said, maize is very important. It's one of our key staple food crops. And the major constraints now is for armyworm. Behaving similarly like the first Scotland move in terms of biology. For armyworm is now a problem in my country. It has caused a lot of damage to our maize. So I'm also looking at getting a Micro insecticide to control this important pest. This is also funded by Kind Kesi of Banga, Banga Africa Project in University of Ghana, Sanitena Grant, sponsored by Carnegie uh, uh, New York, Carnegie New York. So I have a funding to develop a micro insecticide against farm worm in my country as well. Then as far as for armyworm is a prey harvest problem, but when it comes to stored, our stored product insect pest, and as far as maize is concerned, the most important insect pest is this one, this funny one here, larger grain borer. It's actually from Central America. It came into our country and became a very, very big problem, especially because we didn't have predators against this pest then in the 80s. But now, we started a biological control um, program against this pet, what is referred to as classical biological control. So we went for the predator of this insect pest. Predator of this insect pest. So this is actually, let me show you this. 
So it's this store product in CFF within three months can cause this. It can reduce the kennels. The kennels you see here into dust within three months if you don't put in a control measure. Look at all this damage. So it meant that we had to develop a control strategy as fast as possible. So we went to its native country, the Americas, Central Americas, and got this predator, Teutrios negrescens. This is the predator. It predates on the larvae of the adult, the, the larvae of this pest, larger grain borer, Prostiphanos truncatus. It predates on it. So what we do is we grow or we culture, we have established cultures in, in we have our regulatory, what is referred to as plant protection and regulatory directorate of Ghana. They do the culturing. We culture them, establish cultures and introduce them into the world to hopefully multiply and control the larger grain borer for us. That has been, I would say, a bit successful because at least it, it has reduced the incidence in our country, but still the larger grain borer is a problem for us. Because some fail, although we have not done a proper study to actually know what is really happening, some are suggesting that because of rampant bushfires in our country, sometimes we don't, I mean, the, the predator is having difficulty establishing because of that. So I think the program is still on. It started in the 90s. I think 1991, we started culturing and introducing, but we don't know. It hasn't been so successful because of the rampant group fires, as I said, in my country. Insecticides are also a problem. We can't keep using insecticides on our maize, our stored maize. So we looked at using biological entopathogenic fungi, biological control means. Of course, the predator is one of the biological control means, but it hasn't been sufficient because the larger grain borer is still a problem here. So we are looking, we looked at using entomopathogenic fungi. And this has also been published. All our findings has been published. Echampon Ita 2016, 2020, 2023. We have looked at the laboratory um, efficacies. We have looked at the field efficacies. It gave very, very promising results. In the laboratory, within uh, one week, we were able to get 90% control in five days and 100% after the seventh day. In, in semi-field trials, we had very, very, very good control for up to four weeks, excellent control for up to four weeks. But after the fourth week, you can see that the efficacy started declining. So in, I think in uh, one of the papers, I think it's a 2023 paper, we recommended that the formulation that we use should be, I mean, the maize should be retreated so that we can be able to get very good control because after four weeks, mortalities decline. Mortalities decline. So that is that. So this, we use a powder formulation of the entomopathogenic fungi against the larger grain. For it. We are also looking at using these animal pathogens against other important insect uh, uh, crops and even um, medical insects in my country, like mosquito crops, like tomatoes. We are looking at getting animal pathogenic fungi against tomato insect pests because tomatoes is also very important in my country, very essential ingredients in our diet. So essentially, this is what we've been doing as far as biological control is concerned, especially microbial control. Very passionate about this area, and I'm trying to develop a, a, a micro-insecticide to supplement control strategies against them in my country. So I would like to thank Dr. Le Ani, Dr. Dalia Sumwati, staff and students of UNJ and then the University of Ghana for this talk. Thank you so much. I lent your Terima Kasi. <laughs> sama, sama, doctor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mafis, for your uh, presentation. So now we will move to Q&A session. So any question from participants? So if you have question, you can raise your hand and I will 
let you to give your question uh, by uh, speaking or maybe if you have question uh, you can also write in the comment section yeah so any question maybe from participant maybe before uh, before that while waiting for the participant to ask something i would like to have question for dr mafis presentation thank you okay so firstly about the uh the baculovirus that you research on i think on citrus pest yeah yes okay so about this uh, pest uh, is it possible if pest also can have resistant to baculovirus and if so how do you think it's the best way to cope from this possibility? So far, well, the baculovirus was not developed by me. It was developed by other researchers in Citrus Research International. But resistance hasn't been developed so far. Mm. Mm. Okay, so resistance, it's not... Uh, it's not, it's especially for this, especially for the animal pathogens, fungi as well. We hardly get resistance. Okay, so it's not like a chemical, chemical yes. bio, uh, pesticide that can, uh, yes, it can give effect of resistance to the pest. But yes. for this fungi, it's less likely to have. It's resistance. less likely to. Yes, it's less likely. Okay. Except okay. probably you combine it with some chemicals, and the chemicals have resistance to some insect pests. You are less likely to get. Um, resistance developing from this uh, biological control agent. Okay, it's very interesting. And the second one, it's about the uh, insect pest that you research. So, uh, I think you you tried several several uh, fungi, yeah, against the insect. And how about the stage of life of insect that is attacked by this fungi? Is it the egg is it the larvae stage or maybe another stage of life or it can attack well, all of the stage life yes it can infect it's infective towards all the stages of insect but of course you have to test it some of them you would have the larvae more susceptible some of them you have the pp or x more susceptible so you have to test to find out which ones are. but for the this one this particular one the larger grain for the, we because one of my papers you see that the eggs we tested it against the immature stages and they were all of them were infected the fungus was infective against all the immature stages of the pest you have to test it for your targeted insect pest to check which one is more infective so that you put your control strategies more of your control strategies towards the yeah, I see. So we also in, need it, to to test it in laboratory first, yeah, before to the field. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. In the case of post Scotland moth, for instance, we realized that um the pupae, the uh, pupae, 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 pupae stages or the fee finster stages of the larvae were more susceptible. Mm. And then, of course, because it comes, yes, we're more susceptible. Uh, and because the the thief or the final instant larvae comes to pupate in the soil. Our control strategy is more of targeting the PUP. That is why you could see in the the photo that we are using it against the soil dwelling stages. <laughs> this one, so it worked very well against the uh, PUP and the pre pupating stages, which is the final or fifth instant larvae of the first colony moth. So normally. This is what they use uh, 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 to target that one. And once you're able to ta uh, tackle or control the pre-pupating stage or the PUP, then of course you, you'll be able to control because once there's no PUP, no adult is, is also going to be prevalent on your arborea environment. So depending on where you want to target, then you test all the stages of the particular insect and then know which one is susceptible and target your control towards that direction. I see. Okay, it's very clear. Thank you, Dr. Mephis. Any yeah, question, maybe? Problem. Okay, please, Dr. Delia. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's very nice presentation, Dr. Mephis. I really 
have good insight about how to make the entomopathogenic fungi to available for uh, our our um, activity in the 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 plan. So I would like to ask you two questions. First is, is there any possible because uh uh first uh question is, we have a program that uh, international student to attend to our uh, that biology program. Is there any possible if uh, you or your students is collaboration with our student in uh, biology department? That's my first question. Uh, and the second question is about your research. Uh, is there any experience for based on your, uh, during your um, research is about application about the yeast for for entomopathogenic fungi, uh, or you doing just for metarhizium and bufferian? Uh, bu hmm. Yes, so thank you. So yes, I'm happy to collaborate with your university. I'm, as you can see, I'm all into biological control. I really love biological control. So I'm happy to, and as you even, you heard from me that, um, during the presentation is that that I said we have collaboration from several universities. They come here, come and do exchange programs. So some of your students can come, come and learn entomopathology, and then our, my students can also come to UNJ to so we collaborate and do more for our, our, both of our countries. So it's very possible, and I'll be happy to do that. And then concerning my uh, experience, yes, I you, you see. Others, there are several entomopathogens. Even Aspergillus niger is an entomopathogen. Fusarium can also be an. There are several entomopathogenic fungi or others, but we had we don't use them because most of them. For instance, if you have Fusarium or Oxysporium being a very effective, and Fusarium Oxysporium, which is a fungi, a plant pathogen on several crops, being a useful entomopathogen, how are you going to? use it and then make sure it doesn't affect our plants as well. So most of these other fungi that are obtained during assays or during the exploratory phase, we don't use them because they are not totally useful because they will have other negative effects on other plants. And sometimes to their metabolite, for instance, as part of Niger, you know their metabolites are a problem, especially if you are going to use it on maize, aflatoxins and the rest. So some of them are not used because of their other uh, disadvantages or downside, which is also very important. But the good thing about this Bulvaria metarhizium is that worldwide, all the tests have been that have been done, normally we see that they are range of, although they usually have broader host strain, their toxicity is less, they are not going to be inimical in our environment, our water bodies and the rest. So that's why they are the most commercialized species that are used. They are very useful compared to the others. So that's why. But others are used. There are several others which are also used. But aspergillus yeast is it's not something that is used. Thank you very much, Super uh, I Can I uh, ask? Yeah, sure, Dr. Lai, please. Oh, okay, thank, thank you very much. I have two questions for Dr. Maris. Thank you for uh, your presentation. It is very interesting. Uh, you have now two, two fungus, pathogen for uh, insect. Uh, now, which is, is uh, which is uh, better uh, using in, uh, which is more efficacy uh, can using in uh, fields, uh, Bubaria or Metalysia? It depends. You have to, what is referred to as the trade-offs. It depends on your targeted crop. For instance, of insect pest too. Some people prefer Bulvaria because it produces more spores in terms of commercialization. It produces more spores compared to metarhizium. So normally you see that the Bulvaria are the ones that are more used. But if you are looking at, for instance, low cost, then don't go for Bulvaria because the metarhizium's Acridum and derobesis sometimes are more virulent against your grasshoppers and locusts and the rest. And then there's one called Riley, Metarhizium Riley. It's also very useful for soybean and those being uh, leguminous crops as well. So it depends on your targeted insect pest. Thank you. 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 Th
I won't say uh, I will recommend. Okay. It depends on your targeted insect pest and crop. It depends on targets. Yes. And uh, how about uh, environment? Uh, like in a uh, tropical area or subtropical area? And which is one better? Yeah, that, like this. And I think well, maybe Metarizium, it is in your country and maybe in Indonesia and in tropical area, it is better. Well, I guess so. Because in Brazil, like this, they use both uh, metarizium more. They use more bovaria. But in the US, they also use bovaria. So, but what we must also know is, know is that it is usually isolate dependent. Some isolates may work uh, well in tropical places, but may not work in non tropical right. climate. So it depends. It's usually isolate dependent. Some can work in places you would expect not, it not to work. So I think. For that, I would say it's isolated dependent. But some countries, they look at other commercial factors like amount of cornelia that can be produced. As I said, Bulgaria produces more, so some people pre prefer more of the Bulgaria, especially if it's going to be able to give you more in the same control. Why not? Why don't I use the one that I can produce a lot of cornelia and get more money instead of going for metarizum? Of course, as I said, provided it's going to give me equal control or similar control. Or mortality, so some trade offs here and then. Okay, and another question uh, Do you think this metarizium and Vivaria maybe the, can uh, attack uh, beneficial uh, insects like uh, bee, honeybee, uh, no. like uh, predator uh, insect that, that using in bio control? Several research has been done, especially in Brazil. Brazil, you know, biocontrol is very huge in Brazil. They have conducted several tests, and it's well established or documented in literature. They, they realize that it is less, it, it, you know, you have less mortality of your, sometimes even zero mortality, or even when you spray on the bee. So it's less anemical. As to why, because they are also... <laughs> They are also sort of insects. So why is it not working against it? That is something that I think we have to do more research into it. Because, for instance, when I showed you that it worked against the larger grain borer. Let me quickly take you there. I'm coming. Yeah. Sorry. Uh -huh. So this, this particular predator that was brought from, okay. yes, the this predator. We, what I realized was that if I'll get the larger grain borer, if I'll get, let's say, 100% mortality in seven days for the larger grain borer, the predator, which is the Terrigrios, Terrigrios negrescens, I'll get mortality of about, let's say, 10% in the same seven days. So it means it's very, it causes more mortality for the targeted insect per compared to the, the predator. But of course, it's also dependent on the predator you are using. This one has a very glossy cuticle, like outer cover, and hard one as well. So we're thinking maybe the spores comes in contact with it and it's sort of swept away and not more are also able to penetrate or go inside the cuticles. That's why we're getting less, less um, uh, infectivity against the predator. So it depends on the predator, but generally speaking, it is very less susceptible or most of the predators that have been worked on because of, of course as i said this has been this has been used for years or centuries so they realized that mostly the parasitoids and predators are less uh, susceptible compared to targeted uh, atropod pest so that is what i think we have to do more too sometimes you know they see when they do electron microscopy they see that layers of the spores are inside the predator compared to the actual targeted pest. So I think we have to do more to know why we are getting less infection with the predators or the other biological uh, um, arthropod insect pests using uh, biological control. Uh, okay. Yeah, and that meaning uh, that uh, have specific uh, contact with the host and not, not attack like no host attack any insect. And that, that meaning and the uh, metarizium and bioaria uh, have something special with the uh, special contact with hosts, can you not? That meaning uh, and not attack any uh, any target. 
just uh, specific which which is a host uh, speci specific special host uh, just this uh, well, like okay go ahead please yeah, not that oh. meaning uh, not, like when uh, using uh, by control, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, special pathogen uh, attack uh, just uh, some some host special, and have yeah. not not like spray uh, uh, in field and attack anything host and uh, no host. Well, you see, and so pathogens, as I said. The hypocrelians ones, those in the other hypocrelian, the hypocrelis, the hypocrelians, okay. which is the Bulvaria metarizer, generally they have broader host range. But the entomophthoralians, those ones in the other entomophthoralia, they usually have narrower host range, like the entomophthora. Yes, they entomophthora, are very yes. host specific, they but these ones specific, generally yes. have broader host range. So normally, you spray your bovaria, you spray your metarhizium, you expect that other, although you are targeting, let's say, four armyworm or uh, any a specific insect, it will be able to control others as well for you. So uh -huh. in this case, because of that, we spray tactically, like just like the chemical. We, don't just, we just don't spray them anyhow or anytime. We spray when uh, we've monitored and realized that predators and paratosoids numbers are less in the field at that time. So that at least it doesn't destroy our, uh, some of our predators and practices because they have generally have broader host range. But there are others which have narrower, but those ones are not used, used to because of their uh, difficulty in mass production. That's why we don't usually, those ones that have host specific uh, responses. We don't, I mean, you are using biological control. So you, if you have one that is going to control several for you and be, less anemica on your productive insect pest, which is the predators and practice. So then if I can say all oh, the better, because at least it's going to give you bigger control as part of your IP. Yeah, yes, because uh, Metarizium uh, in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia uh, using more Metarizium. And my friend works yeah. on Metarizium and uh, they uh, give some specific to isolate, uh, specific isolate from Indonesia and also and in that isolate from Malaysia and the specific and yani more, more work on metarizium. Uh, yeah. But in my, my country, just Bulgaria, and no, yani metarizium cannot grow very well here in my country. Yeah, that's the issue too. <laughs> that's the issue. That's why people usually prefer the Bulgaria. And the metarizium too, most, some of the species are very specific, like the Rileli ones. Right, many ones are very uh, for, uh, against the soils and all those things. So that's why people prefer, somehow also prefer the Bulgaria, uh, Metarizium. But the Bulgaria, to the good thing about it, as I said earlier, is that, I mean, you can produce, can get a lot of the spores. So in terms yeah, of, huh, yeah. in terms of marketing, okay. then. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Mavis. Welcome. Yeah, thank you, Dr. White, for your uh, question. So we have last question from Dr. Ratna in the comment section. Okay. So okay. are there any endemic insect species causing significant harmful event in your country, Ghana, and how to overcome it? Are there what insects? Endemic insect species that cause it's harmful event in the horticultural field. In your well, country, of course, it, it, yes, several of them, but it depends on the prop. We have several of them which are endemic here, and some of them were introduced and have become a sort of endemic here as well. Like the larger green borer has been here since the eighties, and now it has become a problem here. And there's um, several, but it depends on the crops. We have several of them here, but it's usually the invasive ones that come that becomes a problem. So it depends on the problem we have separate. Is that answering your question, Dr. Atma? Is are you still in here? Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Atna, for the question. Okay, so that was the last question from KNA session. Unfortunately, we have very limited limited time today. Uh, we are close to the end of the event. And before uh, I close this presentation session, I, 
I would like to uh, give our gratitude. Thank you very much, Dr. Mavis, for your valuable time, sharing your valuable uh, knowledge to all of us in here. And we also like to thank Dr. Light for You're your welcome. valuable contribution to many of our speakers for this event. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this event uh, is one step for another step, yeah. And it can open many opportunities of many collaboration, either for teaching, researching, or maybe uh, another thing, yeah, for exchange student, and et cetera. I think uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mavis, Dr. Light, for uh, joining this event. Okay, I will Welcome. return this event to Aulia as okay. our Master of Ceremony, please. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Ms. Pina Rizkalati, for your uh, change back to me as an MC for today. Thank you to Dr. Mavis Akiwa Kambong coming to this event for your valuable time, for all of the knowledge that you shared and may all of the knowledge provided be beneficial for all of us. And it was such a great session and really insightful about crops and entomopathology. And let us also appreciate the moderator who has guided the session of this biology insight entomopathology event on biological control of key insect pest of crops in Ghana, lessons, challenges, and opportunities. We will continue to the next session. There is a symbolic certificate presentation first to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Mavis Agiwa Ajampo. I will invite again Dr. Mavis to join with us for the symbolic certificate that will be given by uh, our coordinator for, of the biology program at Agnipa Wenje. With honor, I invited Ms. Dali, Ms. Dr. Dahlia Sakmawati to join with us again to give the certificate. And the moderator, please display the certificate. Please, this is Dr. Mavis. Thank you very much for a very great presentation and very sharing all of this kind of the knowledge, Dr. Mavis. Thank you very much. Okay, this is the certificate from our department, uh, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Mavis. Okay, so uh, the operator, please conduct the documentation for this certificate symbol. Maybe we will conduct it. Uh, one, two, three, smile. Okay, cool. I think that's all. Thank you so much. And then uh, the next is symbolic certificate presentation to Ms. Fina Rizkawati, MSc, as the moderator that will be given by the coordinator of biology study program. Again, Ms. Dahlia Sekmawati and the moderator certificate, uh, please display by the moderator, uh, by the operator. Thank you very much for a very nice moderator, Dr. Fina. <clears throat> It's very You're great. welcome, Dr. Dania. <laughs> yeah, congratulations for very best moderator in this afternoon. Thank you very much. Okay, as the symbolic certificate is presented, uh, please operator conduct the documentation. In one, two, three, smile. Okay, I think that's all. And last, uh, it's hard to believe that we have reached the end of the day's biology insight, entomopathology, biological control of key insect pests of crops in Ghana. Thank you for all of the participants, invited guests for Dr. Late, and all of the faculty members, all of the lecturers that participate in today's biology insight, entomopathology. May this event be beneficial for all of us. And as, as it remarks to the end of today's session, Please forgive any shortcomings, if any. And last, I, as a, your master of ceremony, bid farewell. I'm Aulir Dasabita, and I'm checking out. Wabilahi utafiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Aulia, dokumentasinya belum ya? Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. Okay. Before we close, let's take a documentation.
please uh everyone turn on your camera okay is anyone already open your camera so i will ask for the uh haliza as an operator please help me to conduct the documentation session we will uh, start by the first slide in one two three okay cool and then in the next slide second slide one two three okay and then next to the third slide in one two three and then next until the last slide in one two three okay thank you so much for all of the participants all of the lecturer and uh the invited guests dr mafis and dr lee thank you so much for your valuable time to join with us in this biology insight and i think <clears throat> Uh, we we reached the end of our session. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And see you in another Biology Insight. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, Aulia. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam.